Welcome, Planeswalkers, to our closed alpha preview live stream for Magic Legends and our first stream of 2021, first of many. This is going to be such an exciting show. We're so stoked to be here. We've got a killer program for you guys, and we're gonna show off lots of never before seen content. We've got some big announcements, and this is gonna be like a longer form video. We haven't really done anything like this before, so this will be super fun. Can't wait to show you guys actual straight up gameplay about an hour long of really cool stuff. So I know you wanna just hop in and get to the content, but first a quick round of introductions and some announcements. I am Sofetch, community manager for Perfect World Entertainment. We are the publishers on this wonderful game you're about to see today. And joined with me today is the one and only Steven Ricosa, executive producer on Magic Legends. How's it going, Steve? Pretty good, pretty good. Not quite the one and only. I am a junior, so my dad's out there floating around somewhere. But uh, but yes, I am super hyped to be here. It's 2021. Um, we are getting ever closer to shipping the game, as we've seen in some announcements. So um, I am hyped for today. Yes, he is our one and only. So speaking of announcements, that's an excellent segue. We've had a bunch of cool stuff that we announced just earlier this week. One of them, I think, was on IGN. What was that about, Ricosa? So we did a big uh, video about deck building and we talked about that, but bigger news, uh, we have our next closed alpha test coming up. Um, the It's starting up in a couple of weeks and the uh, codes will be going out directly after this stream. So if you sign up during this stream, you have a chance of getting in on that stream, on that uh, play test that's happening in just a couple weeks. Absolutely, seriously. The codes are gonna be going out after this stream. You still have time to sign up for probably our last close out the test and you can get in to that test, check it out before anybody else, before, what was the thing that was uh, coming after that, Ricosa? Oh, uh, I think it might be open beta, which is the um, kind of PC, anyone can play, no code, no wipes, full on accessibility to the game 24 seven. Uh, coming up at the end of March. Yes, so excellent. That's super duper exciting. I also want to jump back real quick. Uh, that last closed alpha is going to have double the amount of invites going out than the previous alpha. So 80,000 codes will be going out for this alpha compared to the 40,000 hour for the previous one. So awesome. better chance to get in. Um, good luck. Indeed. So you can sign up right now and have a chance to get into the closed alpha. Keys are going out later today. Closed alpha will be a little bit later than that, but you have a chance to get a key. Go to playmagiclegends.com, sign up. So without further ado, I think we should just go ahead and hop into some gameplay. How do you feel about that? Let's do it. All right, excellent. Let me switch over right quick. And boom, here we are. All right, so what we're gonna be doing on stream today is actually playing through a segment of the game. So our very first stream, I think, was our PAX preview, where we had an enclosed build that was kind of consolidated. It was a really quick experience. It was like halfway through a dungeon, an ordeal, and then you, you finished that up. And then our second stream was more of like a Q&A, and all of our videos so far have just been cuts of different gameplay footage. But today, we're actually going to be playing through the real game. So you can see here already, we're chilling into Zeem. We're going to be playing the Geomancer. And I think this is sort of like very early on in the experience for you guys. So, Rikosa, why don't you sort of set this up? Where are we in the actual campaign of the game right now? Yeah, so um, you have the uh, tutorial, and then uh, you kind of get guided directly into a, a story mission to kind of tee you up. And then you end up here in Briarthorn Glade uh, in the plain of Zendikar. And so you're in the region of Tazim in Zendikar, and um, you've kind of, that area that uh, Jared was just in was the kind of social area where you'll see other people, hang out. Um, you may have seen a little uh, tailor icon where you could, uh, you know, customize your appearance. And now he is in the overworld. So he is running around and you'll have um, quests to guide you to kind of meet some of the inhabitants, to kind of solve some of their problems. Um, and then you might come across um, skirmishes throughout this this area, which are uh, kind of randomly spawning of variable difficulty and scope um, for some pretty cool rewards. As you work your way towards, you know, unlocking uh, your next instance piece of content that you can queue up with people or play on your own. Um, and so that's what kind of Jared's doing now. He's kind of enjoying the Tazim overworld, this neighborhood of the Tazim overworld, um, as he makes his way towards uh, his next 
uh, his next quest to kind of uh, progress through uh, this point. Yeah. And just while Rokosa was talking for like that one minute, a whole bunch of crazy stuff just happened. So we actually found a random event that spawned on top of us. And here's another one too, all right. There's, okay. So yeah, we're in the overworld right now and you can sort of see on the UI how there's a gold uh, diamond and it's pointing us towards our objective. So that's our main story objective. But there's stuff everywhere that's happening around us that we can go and explore. I actually picked up a waypoint there a minute ago. So chat, be sure to remember about that. And uh, I see a lot of questions about movement. And so I think actually, while we're sort of moving through the overworlds, we can chat real quick about movement. So right now yeah. I'm using an Xbox One controller. And this just like feels really natural to me, especially on stream. But there are uh, other kind of movement options, right, Rokosa? You wanna chat about those real quick while I blow yeah, these guys yeah. up? So uh, of course you can plug a controller into your PC if you wanted to use that. Um, it's fully supported. You can also use um, click to move, which is a very popular uh, control mode for um, for uh, ARPGs. And we also have uh, WASD controls for um, those people that kind of play in that way or coming from an MMO background, you can play with your classic WASD controls. And I don't know if you noticed, when Jared went through and touched his keyboard, um, the HUD changed just dynamically. He didn't have to do anything. So if he touched a button as a controller, it'll bounce back and show off um, kind of the, the controller layout. Um, and you can also see um, he only has two um, spell slots unlocked, right? So for people that are aware or aren't aware, um, you collect a deck of uh, 12 spells and you customize that deck up to two colors. And um, four of those spells are randomly assigned to your hand. And as you cast them, um, they'll kind of cycle in and out, kind of like a game of magic. Um, but right now, we're in this tutorialization, so right now you only have two random slots. So as you progress through the game, and it's not terribly long, but as you progress through, you go from two to three to four slots so that we can really uh, get deep into knowing your spells and understanding the mechanic. Yep, awesome. So let's go ahead and hop into an ordeal. So you can see on this screen, this is sort of like our dungeons. Rokosa, do you want to just kind of preface this real quick while we queue yeah, up for it? Absolutely. So, so an ordeal is a... Um, all of our content can be played by one player up to three players. Um, ordeals are kind of planned to be something that you should play with a group, even though you can play by yourself. And our story content is something that you could play with a group, but it's also designed to work well as a solo content. So Jared could probably jump in here and, and play by himself. Um, and the cool thing about our deals is um, they have variable rewards, so they're scored. Most of them have a little scoreboard at the at the top, a little uh, final score, and then you will get rewards that improve based on your score. Excellent. And so, as always, thank you guys for understanding. This is a pre-alpha build, so remember that as we're going through here. This is not going to be totally polished. Actually, I think they made this build just for us. So this is not even what you're going to be potentially playing if you get an. Uh, closed alpha code. This is definitely not where you're going to be playing when we get to open beta. Uh, but you know, it's it's we just really want to show all of this content. And so even though it's early, we appreciate you guys sort of understanding that there will very likely be some bugs and some issues and some performance things, and that's to be expected. But we're just excited to be able to show this off today. And you can see yeah. in the bottom left hand corner we have a pre alpha version listed right there. Yeah. So cool. this is kind of a, a neat map. Um, it, it's somewhat like a um, like a King of the Hill scenario. So um, there are a variety of these little locations, um, similar to what uh, Jared's in right now. And each of these areas um, give the enemies a different buff. And you have a set amount of time in each area to kill as many enemies as possible to increase your score. And then after that time, the location will randomly shift, and it'll be jump. It'll jump to a new spot. And so um, over the course of this 10-minute um, ordeal, you're running through here, taking out as many enemies as possible and um, trying to boost that score. So you can see when the enemy dies, they kind of like launch that little flare that indicates, oh, I got score, I got score. Um, so it's, uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a cool map um, and it can get pretty hectic with three players, but you can definitely juice that score if you're playing with three players. Um, something you might be seeing on the right side of your screen there, uh, we announced uh, an equipment system and while we're not going to get into details now, we're going to save those for a little bit later, you are seeing those loot drops um, with cosmetics dropping right there on the side of the screen. <laughs> a little bit of a teaser for a future stream. I'm sure we will be doing uh, many more. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So you're looking at um, 
a lot of the Tazim, we call it the Tazim Wilderness Group. Um, you're seeing spiders, you're seeing Belladars. Um, you're you're going to see probably at one point you're going to see a, um, a Grove Warden. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of really cool stuff going on here, and um, kind of changes the the type of enemies that you're fighting, changes the way you want to play. So um, in here, you're trying to kill as many enemies as possible. So you're going to have Sapperlings, and a Sapperling counts for just as much as a Felidar, but a Felidar can take longer to kill. So you're um, you're kind of balancing like, oh, I got to make sure these big guys are getting taken out while simultaneously goosing my score as much as possible in the uh, limited time that I have in there. Um, you can also see uh, we've got some elves in there uh, as part of this that are um, from a from a different tribe that are that are causing some problems that you'll kind of learn about throughout the throughout the experience. We've got a Baylock who I have to say is amazing once you uh, once you get it in your deck. Yeah, he's uh, a super Baylock, big boy. Super big boy, you know, big old chonker. And he's got uh, a great enter the battlefield effect. You can kind of two stage target, play some Rever. He smashes a bunch of bad guys, and then he's out there and he's doing great damage. And he's a great target for things like Wild Growth or Mighty Bellow that just make that 6 6 even bigger. Um, and you could tie that in with different things like fight mechanics um, or use him as a tank and, and uh, bring in a bunch of other range creatures. So he's pulling a lot of aggro, holding a lot of enemies, while your range guys are just kind of picking people up. So. You have a lot of really cool options when crafting um, the creature layout of your um, of your deck. Awesome. And so I think we want to talk a little bit about actually the basics of the combat, assuming that this is the first time probably a lot of people are seeing this actual full form uh, exper combat experience. But actually, right quick, uh, shout outs to Cryptic Yavier in chat. She's the new community manager over there at Cryptic. I'm sure you will be seeing a lot more of her soon. Uh, we're gonna try to get her on some streams. She's been chatting with you guys in Twitch chat already. She's introduced herself on, I think, Discord and definitely Reddit. Really cool gal and say hi if you haven't already. She'll be answering some of your questions while I'm dealing with all this crazy hectic stuff that's happening on here. So yeah, Rakosa. Um, well, right before I get into combat, we're looking at a uh, looking at a Grove Warden, and you can see it's got that kind of yellow glow on it. That's because it um, is affixed. It has special buffs on it that it doesn't normally have. Um, but that is an elite boss, so it has a lot of cool things going on. I don't know if you noticed, but anytime a Sapperling went near it, it got a 1-1 one -one buff and became more aggressive. So a lot of cool synergies that are going on with the enemies. Um, that can happen randomly throughout any mission. Excellent. But we were going to talk about some combat. So Yeah, I just kind of um, want to talk about how the class is different because we know that the spells are shared between all the different classes. And I've been using a yeah. lot of the class abilities, so could you detail that for us a little bit? Absolutely. So we're launching with five classes, one for each color. We're currently looking at our uh, launch red class, which is the Geomancer. The and each class comes with um, a variety of abilities. So. Um, since you're using a controller, I'll just use a controller. Um, your right trigger is um, your primary attack. So for the Geomancer, it's punching. But for the Sanctifier, um, it's using a staff. So our Geomancer is a uh, melee class. The, the Sanctifier is our range class. And then we've talked about the Mind Mage before. The Mind Mage is a mid-range class. So that's what your right trigger, your primary ability is. Um, your right bumper is your secondary ability. And your secondary ability is something that really um, in some ways, we think it defines your class. So for the Geomancer, um, it's a huge AOE explosion, which is awesome. Um, but for the Beast Caller, who uses, who uses an axe, um, she throws it in a long line and damages enemies in a huge line um, and tags them uh, in a really cool way. So that's a pretty uh, exciting ability. And then you have your utility ability. And on some classes, it's movement. Some classes, it's, uh, it ties into how you play. So the Geomancer here, has Furious Leap, and so if you tap your left bumper, um, you will do a leap, and you will explode when you land after that leap, because you are a Geomancer and you're red, so why wouldn't you explode with lava and rocks when you land? Um, however, the uh, Sanctifier, the Sanctifier's utility ability does not involve movement, but uh, you kind of kneel down, you become, um, you become uh, immune to damage and you heal your allies. And in fact, when you level that ability up, you also heal, uh, you also will res your most powerful creature that died in the last 15 seconds. So that is a, uh, that is a really cool uh, kind of gamut of abilities that informs how you want to um, play your deck, right? So you want to build a deck and try to have synergy with your class um, at the same time. Um, 
So when you're, so you might have this red geomancer who does a lot of damage on her own. You might want to give her a bunch of sorceries in in your deck, and maybe a few creatures to pull aggro off. Um, whereas you might want to be far more creature focused with your um, sanctifier because you can heal them, or your beast caller because a beast caller because she's green and because her focus is on creatures. Um, her creatures will have more health and do more damage if you're playing that class. So each class has a different reason to play them and um, different synergies with the decks that you're building. Excellent. So I see some people who are very observant in chat noticing that we leveled up and now we have an extra bar above our health bar. Actually, have yeah. we talked about the UI even? Health, mana, yeah, spells. So we haven't really talked about it too much. So the, uh, the blue bar I'll talk about in just a moment. That's called your spark meter. The green bar is your health. And if you look to the left, there's like this little white bar that's filling over it. The geomancer actually, because um, she's a melee class, um, builds up temporary health, right? Kind of like rock armor as she's fighting. So it give, makes her a little more survivable because she has to get in close. And then the bottom bar is your mana bar. And if, uh, right now, Jared's playing a mono red deck, so the bar is red. But if Jared was playing, let's say, a Boros deck, a, a red white deck, which is one of my favorites um, in the card game and in, the, uh, and in our game, um, you'll have it split between red and white. And it is a predetermined mana split based on the, the number of spells and how expensive mana-wise the spells are that you put in your in your deck. So if you have a very small number of, um, of white spells and a large number of red spells, and you'll see like a 70-30 split of your mana down there, and it will generate at the same rate. Um, it provides a great feel. But to the spark meter that just popped, uh, popped up when you level, um, so uh, before you hit level six, uh, your spark meter, when you pull that left trigger, gives you a huge boost of mana uh, for, I think, five seconds, and draws a spell directly into your hand. If you can see he's got some that are um, kind of missing as he's casting them, you can force a spell draw. Um, and so you can see it eats about a quarter of your bar, but you get that huge mana boost during that time, so you really want to get a bunch of spells out. Um, and so he could do that back to back at this point if you wanted. Once you reach level six, you unlock your spark power. And your spark power is a unique, somewhat overpowered ability that is uh, for every single class. So for the Geomancer, when uh, once you hit level six on a controller, you pull both triggers at the same time and you will turn into a giant like lava rock monster. Your primary ability will be this, you know, this huge punch that has a bunch of knockback. Your right bumper becomes this huge AOE that pulls a bunch of guys towards you, and then you'll do this big rock spike damage. And then your left movement ability uh, becomes a roll. So you get this great play off of, do I want to surge my mana and do more damage with my spells? Or do I want to um, pull both those triggers and just kind of be this unstoppable force as that uh, meter burns down. Um, the neat thing is, as you kill enemies, it'll naturally go up a little bit, but there's also drops that enemies uh, drop down. You might see the little planes walk a little bit. And so if you pick those up while you are doing your spark power, it will slightly extend it. So it becomes a situation where you want to go through and pick up more of those while you're killing enemies. Um, I'll name one more that's a little bit different. Um, the Mind Mage, who is our blue class, when you spark with that class, um, you will charm every enemy around you. So you have these little blue tendrils coming from you to all of your enemies, and they'll all start fighting each other. So it becomes this amazing moment where if you have the, this army out, you pull both triggers, the enemies are fighting each other, your summons are fighting them, and then um, you have the ability to do this um, kind of mind shot, just back to back, doing a ton of damage, and really pepper those enemies. It's really useful if you feel overwhelmed. I can't count the number of times that we've been talking about an internal playtest. You're playing a mission like this with three players where the enemy count goes up, the difficulty goes up, or you're playing on a higher difficulty mode, and it seems like you're done for. It's like you're not going to get there. You're totally screwed. Someone pops an ultimate ability and completely turns the tide of the battle. And it was, uh, it was great when we kind of came up with this idea, and it was even better once it was implemented. So uh, pretty exciting there. Awesome. And we just finished that ordeal. We got a pretty good score, and you can see after it's done, you get to open up a chest, there's a nice little flourish, and we got a bunch of cool loot from it. Don't want to spoil too much on that, but you can see we got some card shards, and we can talk about that in a later stream, and if you are lucky enough to get into the closed alpha test, then you can experience that for yourself. So if you haven't already, definitely head over to our website, 
playmagiclegends.com, sign up for alpha. We're gonna be sending out keys for that pr like right at the end of this stream. They're gonna be going out later today. So you still have time to sign up if you haven't yet. Yep. They've cool. got their fingers hovering on the button. To grab it, <laughs> yeah. Shoot it out right after. Sweet, so we finished that ordeal, which is sort of like a dungeon in instance, and now it teleports us back out to the overworld. So from here, we're just gonna do a little bit of questing. I think this is a cool chance for us. Oh, we leveled up to level four too. So check this out. This is where we just were. We were at the Hedron Rush ordeal. This is where we ran from, right here, Briarthorn Glade, and this is where our next quest is. Check out how big this map is. We ran from here to here, and this is how massive Tazim is. And this is just one of many planes that are going to be available at launch. And if you pull that back even farther, that was just a part of one neighborhood. There are three neighborhoods in Tazim, and they're all themed a little bit differently because uh, we're going to see it pretty soon. Spoiler, kind of the, the big bad through that area in Tazim are the merfolk. So you're kind of starting at these upper areas in the trees in Briarthorn Glade, and you're going to work your way down to the coast where the uh, merfolk are. So you start in this very kind of traditional jungle feeling with the waterfalls and, you know, hedrons everywhere. And you're gonna work your way down to the coast and you're gonna see tide pools. And there's gonna be a lot of really cool differences in the environments. And yeah, it's a huge map full of content to do um, with other people, right? This is a, this is a uh, open social map um, as well. Yep, and we're actually gonna be seeing some of that pretty soon. We're gonna be heading yep. down into the second segment. So uh, if you missed it earlier, or if you're just tuning in now, this is still sort of a tutorialized area, but we've passed like the actual instanced tutorial where you learn how to use your abilities and movement and you start unlocking some of your spells. So now it actually kind of plopped us out into the overworld and it said, here you go, have fun, do whatever you want, but we're still unlocking things as we go through. And so you see, yeah. we started off that ordeal with only two spell slots. And now because we've leveled up and we're progressing through the story, we now have four, and we have a bunch of other abilities that we haven't really shown off yet. So it'll be pretty cool to show those once yeah. we actually get to some combat. Yeah, and so over that journey in Tazim, uh, you're gonna be building out your initial 12 spell deck, giving you a chance to learn all your spells. Um, and while we are tutorializing you through Tazim, um, it is a full region. Um, you can come back and replay at full difficulty or higher difficulty modes. Um, it's by no means kind of a, a cast off region. So. Um, you also may have noticed um, it's a huge region, a lot of running around. If you want to just quest through here, you totally can. But um, earlier, uh, before we hit Hedron Rush, uh, Jared picked up a fast travel point. Um, there are fast travel points throughout the map. You only have to find them and unlock them once. And once you do, um, you can find them and fast travel directly to them um, at any point when you're in this area. So if you want to pop back to Briarthorn Glade, change your costume or your buddy's logging in, you can go over and meet them there. Um, or if uh, you just want to bounce around, you're like, oh, I found a skirmish. Like, oh, here's a here's a rare skirmish, and I saw it on the map. I just want to jump to the closest point and do that one instead of running around. Um, that can be part of your play experience as well. Speaking of skirmishes, actually, see this? Should we step in here? I think we have time. I, I think yeah, I think we can make that work. All right, cool. So let's check um, this out. There, so yeah, which one? I gotta see which one this is. You gotta walk into it. Oh, is there someone in there? Is there somebody else playing this? I think there was someone else playing on the show. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I exciting. thought this was just for me. Okay, just well that's all right. Just for you. So this is um, so this is Guild of Start Workers. So in this area, this is a um, this is a uh, major skirmish, uh, which means it's a little more difficult. There are three little trees in here, and there are Baylob hiding in the trees. And you want to clear those Baylob out. So how you're doing it is you have to kind of pull aggro and get three of these silt lurkers into range and kill them. And when you do, the bailoff comes out because he's like, oh, there's there's some free a free meal there, and you're gonna take them out. So there are three in the area to do this to in this in this tight little area. Um, and then you've cleared the area. So you get some pretty cool rewards. And um, this is something that you know Jared's doing this by himself but he ran across that tester that was in here playing, they could have done this together. They could have just stayed in there and uh, and cleared this area out and it would have scaled for them. So you can get people to just like, you're running around in an oval like, oh, they're doing that skirmish. I'm gonna jump in and do that skirmish with them. Um, so it makes for a very dynamic experience, but it's also really good rewards, right? So each of our types of content kind of focus on different rewards, even though you always get a little bit of everything. Um, and it becomes a, um, a fun place to kind of quest 
especially when you're looking for specific types of rewards. If you're looking for green spells, um, for example, questing around to Zine is a, a smart thing to do. Excellent. And so something else I don't think we've really touched on is uh, how the classes themselves upgrade. So it's not just the spark power that you get, but because I think we hit level four, now our basic combo, so I'm just like holding right trigger, our basic combo is improved. And now when I do the one, two, three, four with the uppercut, the uppercut now shoots out a, like a rock, a spine, earthy yeah, spine. A spike. So yeah, so that's that's great. So we're gonna talk about that. The, you saw that you kind of unlocked a little bit where your, um, you know, we got your spark meter, but you're also going to level up each of your primary, secondary, and utility abilities. And as Jerry definitely mentioned, um, you your combo now has this like spike uppercut at the end. Um, another one that's great is your left bumper. Um, you'll get a second jump, so you'll build up two charges, and you can leap, leap back to back, which is amazing for this class. I love to kind of leap into a group of enemies pop off some AOEs, maybe drop a creature to, to um, pull aggro, and then leap right out of there. So um, that's awesome. And then as you progress deeper, you're also gonna be unlocking um, kind of passive abilities that really lean into the class. So for example, red is um, you know all about damage, chaos, and the Geomancer um, really specializes in um, casting damaging sorceries. So as you progress and unlock those passive abilities, um, a damage sorcery at the exact same level that's cast by the Geomancer will do more damage than a damage sorcery that is cast by a Sanctifier, even though the spells are the same level. The other side of that is a healing spell that's cast by a Sanctifier will heal more than the exact same spell at the exact same level that's cast by the Geomancer. So there's trade-offs where the higher you get in progression, the deeper you lean into what you're strong at. And then all of that culminates um, in a trait and the trait, once it's unlocked, is something you can take to any class. So you have three trait slots. And so once you max out three classes, you fill those out. But once you've maxed out more classes than that, you have to choose which trait you want to have. And they're all kind of interesting abilities. So the trait for the Geomancer is a, um, because you're in there and you're punching and you're in the middle of the guys all the time, um, if you die in combat, you will immediately pop back up with 50% health. Um, that takes, I think, three minutes to recharge, but that's something you could have access to on any other class once you've unlocked it, right? So um, it's a pretty cool feature. There's a, there's a lot to kind of level up and unlock, but the goal of these classes isn't that, oh, I rolled a Geomancer. If you want to play a Sanctifier, I better log out, create a new tune, and then play a Sanctifier. Um, your Planeswalker can play as any class. A class is just part of your loadout. So. You've been playing, you've been collecting spells, you've been leveling up spells, you've completed the tutorial region and a couple of others. Um, and so now, um, I'm, you know, maybe I want to feel like playing a Sanctifier. So, you know, you're on level, you're halfway leveling on your Geomancer, you, now you can play as Sanctifier. And the cool thing is your Sanctifier might be level one, but you still have all the spells you've collected. They're all the same level because they're on the same character, just part of the loadout. So it makes it very easy to, to play and level all of the classes that we have um, in the game and then collect all of those um, all those traits. And then it gives you a little extra customizability for how you like to play. It's like, oh, I really like the healing and the range damage of my Sanctifier, but I want to run a blue-black deck because I feel like I like being at range and I like having those synergies in those spells. And you can definitely do that when you're playing. So. Finding the right class that plays into the deck style that you find um, most exciting is uh, a really cool option that exists in the game. Yep. And we've already announced the first five Planeswalkers that are going to be available when we enter open beta. So you can check out our website, playmagiclegends.com. Be sure to sign up for the close alpha as well while you're there. And you can read a little bit of details. Like, I know we've been showing a lot of... Um, Mind Mage and Geomancer, and I thought this would be a good stream for Geomancer just because it's really like in your face, it's brutal, punchy, it's fun, it's flashy, but we will be definitely be showing some of the other Planeswalkers here pretty soon in, in future streams. Yeah, and it works out pretty well. Um, there's a, we talked about it a little bit, there's a, a resistance or a, a vulnerability system in the game. So, um, you know, certain creatures have a weakness to certain colors based on the, based on the color pie for magic. And so taking a red class into a green region uh, makes sense, right? So it's a situation where you will do bonus damage against creatures of that color um, 
if you're using the the proper sorceries against them and it'll tell you right when you're looking at the mission that you want to pick it'll show you which colors this map uh the creatures on this map are vulnerable to so if you really want to min max you can make sure that you bring uh the appropriate dual color deck or even single color deck to that mission um but if you just like no i like my deck enough then you can just roll in here with um, any color deck you want and choose to not have the um, additional damage while you're doing it 